Welcome to Pros from the Underground, coming to you from my basement in northern Michigan, where I read, write, think, and say things, and sometimes I get to talk to someone. Well, today I talked with a mighty force. First, a quick thought on fiction. As many of my comrades know, I'm not a content person in this sense. I don't really give a rip what a story's about, whom it's about, where it's set even. Instead, I read fiction because I want the storyteller to do something to me. I want the narration itself to do something to my life. And Jack Driscoll is one of the best tellers among us all. And by that, I mean the whole stinking species. I don't think I'm overstating it. People far and wide have been studying Driscoll's work for years. And here's the thing. His stories are first and foremost accessible. In other words, they're not studied because they're syntactically, organizationally complex because he's pulling any strange tricks. He's not, and that's what's so compelling. Uh, they are instead what I would call experientially complex. The reader gets pulled around into the folds and fissures of another life. So far deep inside a character's life that each story for me ends in a state of wonderment. How did I end up here? So, uh, the impetus for this interview is the, the release of 20 stories, a collection of old and new works from throughout Jack's career. The new stories were especially compelling to me, not simply because they were new to my head, but um, because of what they do. And as more and more folks read this, I hope someone will get in touch with me and we can discuss what's going on in these new stories. That is at once entirely Driscollian, but also maybe something re super refined in that corpus. Anyway, here we go with Jack. I wasn't able to get a video uh, of Jack for technical reasons, uh, but I have a full phone interview here and it's a bit longer than my typical interview and I think every utterance is worth it. Here's Jack. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to ask you the, the big one uh, right out of the gate. Uh, I want to know how you think about plot. And, uh, you know, I've suggested that, you know, reading your stories for me and I, maybe for lots of other people is, is not so much a, a movement through causality or forward time, but is a, a process of worming further down in to the, all the inward folds of a character. Uh, so I just wonder how you think about plot, what your, what your process is, what, what uh, you're wrestling with when you put together what someone might call a plot. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for that observation. It's absolutely right. Um, uh, plot for me is uh, simply a vehicle by which um, to reveal multidimensional uh, flesh and blood characters. Uh, as Raymond Carver reminds us, fiction that counts is about people, uh, what they're feeling, what they're thinking, what they're trying to keep hidden and why. Do you remember uh, T.S. Eliot's The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock? Of course. High school? Yeah, of course. Yeah, where the speaker says, um, I put on a face to meet the faces that I meet. Mm -hmm. And uh, my job as a writer uh, is to take off those masks or personas, what I call the disguise. Mm -hmm. um, because as the poet Richard Blessing says, behind every mask, there lies a mask but one. And behind that one, the real self resides and so again you're right um, the, the inward direction uh, to character is my plot and that's the place I'm always trying to get to which is deeply emotional and psychological before any serious reader will possibly care can possibly care and to sell for less will likely produce what we in the trade refer to as cardboard or consensus or herd type characters, mm -hmm. personages instead of persons, outlines. Um, what matters to me and, and only matters is the interior life, what my longtime great friend Pete Fromm calls the swirling vortex of doom. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, 
he's talking, of course, um, about um, outside, the inside, exterior, the interior, circumference, the center. Um, again, what you just referred to as that inward direction. Yeah. That's how I think about plot. You know, I, I've been reminded of several things. One, uh, an, another mentor of mine, Lee K. Abbott, uh, liked to say, and I think he was quoting, and I don't remember whom he, he was uh, channeling here, but he liked to say that uh, character is who you are in the dark. Uh, and so it's, it's that secret, uh, all exactly those piles right. of secrets mm-hmm. that... Um, the other thing that's really compelling to me is, you know, we, we always hear, you know, a story can't be a character profile, you know, the character has to mm-hmm. do something, struggle with something, get to something. Um, and there, there are several of your stories, especially those in this collection uh, that are new stories, that seem to me, this, uh, at the end, I just found myself uh, in a kind of wonderment, maybe along with the character, and I'm thinking, oh, this is how we've ended up here. Um, so the stories felt like, like th- the character and I both went through something to figure out how in the heck we ended up in this particular place. And that was the story. Oh, like mm-hmm. the discovery yeah. was that. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Um, uh, that we sometimes, or my characters anyway, find themselves in, st- in places and under circumstances and in places which they could not possibly have imagined until they arrive there. And then what are they going to do um, with all of it? So as you can tell, I'm, I'm a giant fan, and I, I think that your stories do all kinds of things perfectly, where character, plot, subtext, etc. But there has to be something that bedevils you, some part of the process or some element uh, that makes you um, stay up at night. It, can you? Are you willing to talk about that? What what part is hard for you? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I'm willing to talk about it, and my answer is is pretty simple. Um, uh, my uh, what what bedevils me is getting the words right, mm. um, or um, you know Coleridge, best words in the in the best order. Um, and for me, that means uh, to compose, I suppose, as musicians do, um, with a listening ear. Um, or as um, I quote a lot of people, some, some, uh, some people think I have an edetic memory. Um, mm. I think maybe I used to, but it's less so these days. But um, uh, the writer David Roderick says, it's not the tale that pleases, it's the telling. And by which I assume he means the voice or what Mary car refers to as the delivery system and so remember um if you even knew um that i began as a poet and um not so long ago i was introduced as uh, as a poet masquerading as a novelist um it's uh, which i loved by the way and it's what compels me most and why i love writers um but the lyrical fictionists and non-fictionists um, and that would include, by the way, um, the writer you just invoked, uh, Lee K. Abbott, mm-hmm. um, and others such as Joan Didion, uh, Anthony Doerr, uh, James Baldwin, uh, the Australian writer Kate Kennedy, Flannery O'Connor, our own um, Stu Dybeck, mm-hmm. uh, to name a few, Elizabeth McCracken. And um, as a poet, I always believed if I wrote an opening first line, that intrigued me, it would make possible what was said in the second line and the third and so on, um, absent any clue about where I was headed. And this hasn't changed as a fiction writer. And so both as a poet and as a fiction writer, I'm most comfortable in the, in the presence of not knowing. Mm. And then surprising myself with what I discover by following hunches or glimmers some sense that the story will, if I stay open to possibilities, write me into what it always intended to be. And I'll uh, invoke a former teacher of mine, John Irving, mm. who, I, um, who I studied with as an undergraduate. I think it was my fourth undergraduate college. Wow. I uh, signed in, signed out, and because I really hadn't found um, a teacher, a voice, uh, who was speaking a language I much cared about. Um, and John was the first living writer I think I'd 
even ever met. And somewhere, and, and, and I'd been saving up uh, questions, uh, you know, writerly questions. I wanted answers to things. I was terribly uh, naive, but passionate about needing to do this with no encouragement from anybody I'd ever met before. Um, when I would tell people, even when I was very young, about 11 years old, uh, that I wanted to be a writer, they would just, they would look at you with that, that dismissive smile <laughs> as if, as if to say, you know, Jackie boy, um, you know, you'll get over this, uh, as soon as you grow up, right. uh, that right. kind of thing. Well, of course I never did. And one of the questions, um, one of the questions I asked John Irving was uh, a structural question. Uh, I asked him. Uh, I, I now know better, John. I know that that um, that process cannot be prescriptive. The way John was going to do it had no, no bearing on whether I would feel comfortable doing it this way or not. But the question I asked him was, um, "How do you write your novels?" <laughs> Pretty <laughs> open ended, <laughs> and he said he actually went. Uh, if I remember right, he actually went to the board I was you know, this was just the two this was the two of us talking it wasn't part of a class and he said um, well I outline it I go from A to B to C mm -hmm. to D to E and I said to him um, well doesn't that kind of negate Frost's Robert Frost's um, um, edict about no surprise for the writer mm -hmm no surprise for the reader. And he said, oh, no, absolutely not. He said, just because I know where I'm going, uh, I have no idea what's going to happen along the way. And um, so I guess what we're talking about here uh, is the um, is the bedevilment. Um, and we're back, again, we're back to plot. And um, I just, what I do is I write a sentence that intrigues me enough to want to sentence number two which makes possible what happens in sentence number three, mm. and trust that um, that I will make um, these um, surprising discoveries that I couldn't possibly have anticipated until I started to inscribe. You're riding the language into the sunset, and it's something that uh, exactly yeah yeah no it's all about that and it's all about it's all about listening um, to the, those sentences. And if I can feel that beat, I mentioned, you know, music uh, earlier. Um, and I remember uh, at Interlochen, uh, Robert Bly came to visit. Oh, wow. And he was talking, yeah, and he was talking to, to the writing, the creative writing majors. So it was a very, you know, it was a, a fairly small group. I would say maybe 20 uh, 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 high school kids in the room with him. And, you know, he always has um, an ancient string instrument with him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and somehow uh you know it, it came around to music and he pointed to his um he pointed to his eyes and he said the eyes report to the brain but the ear reports to the heart mm -hmm. and then he played a couple of notes on that and that might be the thing that uh, musicians do that writers can't ever quite and then of course you know i'll read somebody like um well, the aforementioned, um, and throw a few more names in there, um, Marilyn Robinson, for one, and I think, okay, uh, maybe writers can, and, um, and that's the tunefulness I'm talking about, and why it is I pay such close attention uh, to the words and the sound of the words, etc. Beautiful. Yeah, I think the cadences, um, the, the, the rhythms, the rhythm of the prose is is not lost, I think, on, on me, you. certainly. And it's, I, I bet if we had a whole room full of me's that we would all <laughs> sing in yeah. chorus about that. Um, so, yeah, well, great, wonderful. And yes, thank you again. And um, I'll just interject this one, one, one last on this note. Um, the, 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 the late uh, Walter Pater said, uh, uh, not talking only about writing, talking about all art. He said, all art, and this is the verb he used, conspires, all art conspires. To the condition of music. That's what he was talking about. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a slight follow-up question to the to the devilment. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, was is there a particular story that you can think of in in the 20 stories um, that was particularly um, difficult that that made you work harder than 
maybe you wanted to work when you think back through all of these? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I wish we could have a, a whole conversation on hard work. Yes. Um, what that means. Um, but I know we don't have that time. It would be a great conversation. Um, and I remember that JFK said in one of his famous speeches, hard, hard is what makes it great. Yeah. And, and, um, and I agree. And, um, you know, writing that first keeper, you know, the one that helped us to keep the faith, uh, does not by any stretch of the imagination make the process any easier, given that each next story imposes its own set of demands. And in fact, I think writing that first, what you consider good story, uh, does change you forever. Yeah. But it also makes every story that uh, forthcoming that much harder. Um, and plus the hope, of course, is to believe that next story will be the best one you've ever written. And if you don't believe it, then don't bother even to begin. Mm-hmm. And I guess the story that comes most immediately to mind, uh, and based on how many times I failed in my attempts to write a second person story, oh, yeah. is is called um, on this day uh, on this day you are all your age uh, on this day you are all your ages. Yeah. Um, and um, the need to, to break through, which is always my hope, my intent, to that place where I hadn't uh, yet arrived. Uh, I suppose that this is a safeguard, at least in part, against writing variations of different versions of that same story. And I'd written, uh, I'd been, I'd read um, a number of uh, second-person stories that I really loved, and um, but I just couldn't do it. Uh, Pam Houston, refer, who I um, used to teach with, mm. um, refers to second-person narration as the first person embarrassed. <laughs> and I <laughs> and good. I and I admit I did it, at least in part um, consider it a potential contrivance, uh, a distancing conceit that just announced itself so blatantly, um, but discovered in the process of inscribing that it it actually provided a different slant or angle or view from which to capture the internal wrench and royal of of marjorie's forward and backward Mm -hmm. moving life yeah um so so there was that part of it and then the other uh, difficult part was um well structurally it was it's a kind of montage or pastiche structure Mm -hmm. as it were um what i call a kind of poof 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 rather than the more conventional through line and a delivery I doubt I could have managed with first or third person narration. And so, yes, it was a keeper. Um, and I, so it's in, it's in the book. And, and I think to myself, right, how do you know until you try? Yeah, it's, it's really brave, also, not just in the, in the point of view, but where we land, which is the very beginning of this life. Mm-hmm. And, um, and suddenly the narrator oh, has this, very strange positionality where where we're where the you is being spoken to and I won't let the cat out of the bag for people who haven't read it because it, it's really gripping what happens to to you as a reader when you experience this um, but we get to a place where the 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 protagonist is um, not able to really comprehend what's being said and yet the the cop she's still being addressed it's it's really brave, and I, I found myself uh, giggling in bed, which is always a great thing when you, <laughs> when you read a story and you find yourself at 2 in the morning giggling to yourself. Um, that's, that's pretty good, John. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, if it has that effect on the reader, okay, so the transfer has been made. That's right. You know, good for me. <laughs> Pat myself on the back. Thanks. Right. I made him, I made a man giggle. To himself in bed at two in the morning. That's, <laughs> that's something. I'm there. So, uh, a, a question about the the whole collection, um, mm-hmm. and and I hope this doesn't sound corny because it's sort of a uh, biographical, maybe psychological sort of question. But but I, I mean it in the sense of you know the artist looking at the artist's corpus, um, mm-hmm. and I'm sure you've had plenty of thoughts about this. So I wonder. You look over these these stories that are that are housed in this particular fashion. Um, do you see a fundamental difference between early stories and later stories, or, or maybe there's some um, 
coherence. Maybe there's a, a persistent quality that you've been pursuing uh, mm -hmm. over the years. When you, when you see your work housed in this way, what are you thinking? Yeah, I, I think it's I think it's both. Um, so my answer is yes, mm -hmm. um, and um, it's one of the reasons I decided on a new and selected to show the arc or evolution of a lifetime, writing mm -hmm. short fiction. Um, thematically, for example, the earlier work focused on the relationship between fathers and sons. Sure. Um, I learned this when I, when I read reviews of uh, the question wanting only to be heard. Um, um, I did not know my father well. Uh, he who worked 16 hours a day, 364 days a year, taking only Christmas off, um, believing he could leverage for his five children a better life by providing for them a college education. Um, in other words, nothing for him everything for his kids, a total renunciation, which I define and have defined for a long time now with one word and one word only, love for his mm. children. Mm. And the downside was that I didn't know him in ways I so badly wanted to. And years later, I doubled down on this front after reading um, James Joyce, who promised Irish lads like me that we would in the end reconcile with our dads. Mm. And that never happened. And I found myself obsessed, and maybe it's true, I don't know, this is pure conjecture, that we go through a lifetime of writing um, following one obsession or another. Uh, one, two, two for me. Um, and um, in other words, writing to discover if I could, not stories about me and my father, but the relationship between fathers and sons, mm -hmm. and writing about it to discover if I could. Uh, it's deep and abiding and complex emotional contradictions. Not how circumstances should or might have been, but rather to describe as accurately as I could the loss and estrangements of, of estrangement of that life as it was. Does that make sense? It to does. You? Uh, it does. You, you said two obsessions. Are, are those folded together or is there one outside of the uh, father-son relationship? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, yes, in the more recent stories, um, I found myself, uh, again, unconsciously, uh, I didn't sit down with this in mind. I just started writing, and I found myself writing about the nature of time, in part, no doubt, because of getting older. Um, and um, this is what a single poem can do to you, I suppose, it did to me, uh, falling in love some years back, what, but decades ago now, with a poem by Galway Canal called The Road Between Here and There, okay. in which um, the speaker says, uh, here I sat beside the river steaming boulders and put my head in my hands and considered time, which is next to nothing, merely what vanishes and yet can make one's elbows nearly pierce one's thighs. And I recite that a lot. Um, and so there the speaker is in the pose, pose of Rod Rodin's The mm -hmm. Thinker, double-fisted and deep and concentrated rumination about time and what happened here and here and here on the road between here and there. It's an amazing poem. Um, and about the five new stories included in 20 stories, new and selected, I've already heard from a number of readers that tonally they felt a tenderness, a softer tone or delivery mm. than what I'd previously written. I can ask you um, if that holds true. And I'm um, really so grateful to be hearing this, having sensed, even while writing the stories, that it might in fact be true. And uh, I mean, who knows, John? Uh, maybe the evolution has something to do. And now we're circling back. That's where. That for me is how good conversations work. You come back through the same door with uh, another take on it, and uh, so maybe in the in in the course of um, you know half a century of writing short stories, I've become a more attuned listener to the song of my own sentences, something like that. Yeah, I found myself maybe the way the stories are housed in the, in the in the book, um, uh, relationships between children and mothers. 
um, mm-hmm. trying to find meaning, traction, hope yeah. um, in the mm-hmm. wake of a father gone somewhere, um, mm-hmm. uh, gone away or gone to the, the interesting characters who simply go to the margins for instead mm-hmm. of disappearing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's, um, yeah, I, I hope it's a sign of uh, compassionate characterization yeah. and, um, and, and I want them to be hopeful stories. Um, I, I don't set out again. I don't set out knowing anything. Um, but I do when I'm finished, uh, think, okay, even against, even against, uh, enormous odds, these are dare to hope characters yeah. and pretty, and, and oftentimes they really are down and out. And, uh, maybe that at least puts me, the writer, in a position of grace to believe that these people might be okay. I also am struck by the, the your antagonists are what I've called in other places are are tender monsters. In other words, they're they're not um, often the kind of antagonist that we're all invited to disdain mm-hmm. openly without qualification. Um, we find out that they're often helpless and. Um, and tender in their own weird and frustrating ways, which, which is in necessary for me. I hate it when I get a, a, a story that, that or stories that, that consistently make me uh, comfortable in hating the antagonist. And you don't do that. Yeah. No, and I work hard not to do that. Uh, again, um, uh, by whatever uh, by whatever word, um, uh, compassion, grace, empathy. Uh, you know, it's about perception and understanding why these uh, characters, um, unlikable characters, and we have plenty of them mm-hmm. in our literature, um, uh, it's not, not, not only what they did, but why they did it. Following your characters back to that place where something went terribly wrong, yeah. um, a place you could never quite get back from. Yeah. And if you make the attempt to understand behavior, the, the bad decisions, um, et cetera, then, um, then it's hard to hate those characters. Yeah. Uh, if you don't understand, if they're all that one thing, just, you know, un- unmitigated evil, um, first of all, they're not interesting to me at all. Yeah. Yep. I, I think we can all name a handful of um, purely evil characters in, in literature. If it's mm-hmm. Huck's father or uh, right. you know, uh, Anton Sugar and in, in Cormac McCarthy, you know, <laughs> yeah. where and, and, but they're not characters; they're forces. You know, they're That's right. they're something That's right. for the other characters to manage or or to uh, get away from or or something. You know, they have there's mm-hmm. the force to process. Uh, and what's great about, in fact, the way, when you were talking, I thought I I know in some place in my in my quiet thinking when I start a Driscoll story at some point I'm going to go to that one moment uh in the character's life that is um a crater moment like oh this is what happened Uh, and it's not going to happen in the first paragraph it's going to happen several pages in and it's gonna it's not necessarily going to jump from the narrative bushes uh but it's going to come at a time and a place that you're not quite ready for and that's that's a compelling kind of a moment in each story. It happens consistently. God, now you're making me think I should go back through and, and chart those stories out, but that would be unfair. But I, I think that's really <laughs> compelling that you say that, uh, uh, that we're going back through because it happens consistently in your stories and it's a huge payoff. Mm-hmm. I've said thank you a number of times and I do again <laughs> um, yeah, uh, for, your, for your close reading. And, and some of this might have, uh, again, this is conjecture, I'm just thinking um, off the top of my head now, um, have something to do with the nature of the short story. Sure. Um, that what I call, I like to call the light, uh, the, the white light or the white fire mm. of, of the story. Um, something that is un, unsustainable, novel length, and why people like, if I'm right about this, um, since you mentioned Lee K. Abbott, mm-hmm. um, did he ever write a novel? He never published a novel. Uh, he, mm-hmm. of course, I, I ask him, and I, I know that people have asked him uh, that he he drafted some, uh, mm-hmm. and he he did tell me that that he never never published a story. Uh, he has some really great stories about uh, personal tales of. Um, 
uh, writing various and other genres to to make a buck when he was younger and he he found yeah. himself just coming right back to the short story mm-hmm. yeah and i don't think S- S- Stuart dieback uh, ever wrote a novel okay um and uh uh, you know, the, a market, the market criteria demands and makes, uh, uh, I think, younger writers believe that s- uh, somehow short story writing is a, a warm up for the novel to yep. be. Sure. And I, I feel ent- entirely otherwise about it. There's nothing that I love more because I can find uh, uh, I, I'm always looking for and, and hoping to find poetry's place in the prose. Mm. And uh which is what I mean when when I said um, it's unsustainable. It, it would it would try to do this novel length and it would burn out like a comet. Yeah, yeah. I am so grateful that you uh, took the time to come here and, and talk with us. I think already uh, we could um, charge master's degree fees. <laughs> for those who get to listen in. I didn't think, maybe we should have thought of that beforehand. (laughs) Uh, This has been great, John. This has been so much fun. Um, Thanks for having me on.